purposely. Your life, God's purpose. Listen at onpurposely.com. You probably know the feeling where you're starting to think you're just extremely overwhelmed, or maybe you're a little sleep deprived, or maybe you just need one more big handful of peanut M&Ms. I'm Julie Lyles Carr. This is the All Mom Does Podcast. And As moms, sometimes it can be a little bit hard to identify exactly how we're feeling because every day brings with it so many different kinds of feelings. Those moments when your kids are being so cute, you can hardly stand it. You just think your ovaries are just going to burst out of joy. (laughs) Those times when you think, if I don't get some quiet, I don't know what's going to happen next. I am so thrilled to have Courtney Devich on. She really specializes in talking to moms about all of the different complicated feelings you can be feeling when you're a mom. Courtney, thanks so much for being on the show today. Thank you so much for having me. I'm glad to be here. Absolutely. Now, you are a busy, busy woman. You have a, <laughs> you've got a full house with three kids. You've got a little baby that you are nursing and taking care of and not getting a lot of sleep around. But you also have done a ton of writing in places like Her View from Home, Today Parents for Every Mom. You've got a book. You've got all kinds of things that you're doing, social media presence, all the things. So thanks so much for all that you do to encourage moms today. You're welcome. That's what I'm here for. (laughs) Well, you've done a lot of conversation around the feelings of anxiety, depression, feelings like that for moms. I want you to take me back and When we talk about anxiety, we've had other guests on before. I know that this is something that so many women are grappling with. But Mm -hmm. why don't you give me your working definition of what anxiety is? What, when somebody uses that word, what Mm -hmm. are they describing when you hear that word? So I would say that probably like the the clinical or medical explanation of it would be the persistent worry that interferes with our everyday life. Um, My definition would be, um, I worry I'm scared a lot. (laughs) Just to kind of like put it plain and simple. Um, It's worrying about, you know, am I messing up my children? Um, The fears of, uh, is something bad going to happen to my kids if I do this or that? Or, you know, the decisions that I am facing every single day as far as where should I send my kids to school like what should we eat for dinner even because like is that healthy or DiGiorno's pizza is that okay um then it's just the the constant racing mind and those thoughts that I just cannot escape especially when I'm trying to sleep at night not being able to turn my brain off just racing mind over things that I should not even be worried about at 1 a.m especially when I have a I'm sleep deprived and I have a baby and yet I still can't turn my brain off. Right. Um, so it is, it's fear, it's worry, it's obsessiveness, it's overthinking. Um, and as you know, the clinical or medical definition says it's persistent and it's not, um, it's affecting our lives and it's affecting our motherhood when we're not able to enjoy motherhood. And that's kind of the whole premise of the book is just taking our joy back from our anxiety so that we can enjoy motherhood because these days and time that we have with our children is so precious. Right, right. And Courtney, as you're talking about all the things that you're juggling, the feelings that go on and those feelings of fear and everything else, I, I'm laughing because I can hear your kids upstairs banging around. And yep. I'm sure that in that way that <laughs> as moms, you know, we're having this conversation, we're looking at each other and chatting, but our brains are doing 27 different things also on high alert yeah. because we're trying to make sure are the toddlers okay? Has the dog been out? Are they, is that package being delivered? It feels like to me as women, the way that our brains need to work today with so much input, with so many things to keep track of, it's setting us up in a lot of ways, even if we haven't felt like we were an anxious person in the past, when you have to keep your satellite dish that wide open all the time Mm -hmm. to be trying to read for every kind of input, it just seems to feed into the feeling. Do you find that to be true? Yeah, and I mean, my oldest is heading to kindergarten here in two weeks, so it's like thinking about all of these other like extracurricular activities like we got soccer starting and oh did I get the birth certificate and the immunization records and just all those things and I I really have like tried to tell my kids like we're only doing like one activity at a time because I cannot I don't have the bandwidth to be running kids 
and carting kids everywhere, you know, every day of the week. Um, so I think just even all of that that moms have on top of us, taking the kids to soccer practice and dance and trying to keep track of it and having calendars for our calendars as well, um, just puts a lot on the mental load of motherhood. Calendars for our calendars, guilty as charged. Yeah, <laughs> definitely doing that. We've talked about some of the emotions that we may become very aware of when it comes to this umbrella of anxiety. But one of the things that I hope we're getting better about identifying today and thinking about is the physical impact of anxiety. Now, you talked mm-hmm. about trying to go to sleep at night and the head spinning and all mm-hmm. of the things. What are some phys- other physical symptomology we should pay attention to? Because Courtney, I got to tell you, I would have told you for a long time that I wasn't someone who was anxious because I would get all the things done. Mm -hmm. And later I realized that that level of productivity on my part and going, 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 trying to Mm -hmm. make sure that all these loops were closed, not Mm -hmm. being able to rest unless these loops were closed. As it turns out, I think that was some good old fashioned anxiety. And Mm -hmm. yet I didn't identify it as such because I was productive. I was getting stuff done, all the things. So how do you navigate that when it comes to the physical symptomology? What should we be looking for? What are things that may actually be anxiety that we didn't recognize that's what it was Mm -hmm. that show up in our physical bodies? So all of us are capable of having anxiety. It's, It's just an emotional response that we have you know, when we've got a threat in front of us, it's that fight or flight response that we all possess. So when our anxiety believes there's a threat in front of us and there's not, and it starts taking over, we can start feeling dizzy, um, lightheaded, shaky. Um, We're running through in our minds the racing thoughts of what do I need to do to um, avoid that threat or what's the what if, if that were to to happen. Um, For me, it manifests a lot of irritableness. I'm very, very snappy with my children and I let the anger unleash and the mom rage, which I am not proud of and really working on in therapy right now as we speak, Mm -hmm. actually. Um, So irritable and that and the irritableness could be just because the heightened anxiety to where the point where we, we just can't take anymore. But it also can be because we're not sleeping very well either and we're tired. Um, So those are some of like the physical aspects of it. And a lot of that, if it's amplified you know, debilitating, it could be an anxiety attack or a panic attack. Um, panic attacks um, are something I haven't struggled with in a while, thank- thankfully, um, but it is something that I've, you know, just crippled down on the bathroom floor, feeling nauseous, like my stomach hurts, I need to vomit, um, spinning room, like those are a lot of the, the physical things that can take over when anxiety kicks in because it's there's a threat and I need to fight that threat and take over. It's the adrenaline rush. basically. Right, right. You get ready to to take off and run or do whatever Mm -hmm. you need to do, even though it may be something that's just in the mind. I've heard people talk about the fact that with all that we are exposed to today, including things like, you know, headline news coming across that is something very upsetting or sad, the things that we see on social media and somebody saying, hey, be aware, I heard about this situation or this case in this other city. So when it comes to your kids, make sure you're on alert. You know, we today have access to more information, more alarming information, more Mm -hmm. concerning information than ever before. So for a lot of us, while we might not have struggled so much with anxiety before we became parents, once you become a parent, there is so much to think about. And anxiety can be really heightened during that time, even if you thought that you were always a laid back person. But Courtney, you and I have both probably heard people say, well, if you have enough faith, you know, the Bible says, fear not, fear not, fear not, which Mm -hmm. it does. But how do you make alignment between this very real experience that you're having of feeling anxiety, of feeling fear, or feeling that fear or flight, And yet, at the same time, you're a person of faith. Mm -hmm. And so you may have those voices in your world, too, who, in trying to help, but may be trying to diminish or discredit the very real feeling you're having. Or you might even end up with a sense of shame. If I just had enough faith, then I wouldn't be feeling this way. How do you handle all of that? I've had to learn to handle a lot (laughs) when you when you're posting about it on uh, social media to the whole world of strangers. You get a lot of the you just need to pray more. Um, It's the devil and uh, you need to have more faith. You need to believe more. Um, The Bible does say fear not a lot. um, But a lot of the times when I'm also looking through those verses, it's saying fear not for I am with you. Fear not for I will uphold you with my righteous hand. Like 
so God is constantly reminding us not to fear, but he also, on the other side of that verse, most likely than not, is saying, I am with you, and I will be with you, and I will uphold you, I'll strengthen you, I will not leave you or forsake you. Um, so he's giving us that comfort right there. It's not necessarily like a, oh, fear's not going to happen, because it will. This world right. is scary. Um, but when it does happen and when fear does come knocking, I am right there beside you is the comfort that I find from it. And the whole biblical foundation of my book um, is Psalm ninety four nineteen, which is when anxiety was within me, your comfort brought me joy. Um, so it is about the comfort that we'll receive from God and his word. And finding our joy in that. So um, kind of going backwards to what you said there, I, I really just try to, when I'm met with people that are saying, just pray more, believe more, or um, you don't have enough faith, like trying to remind people and spread the message that anxiety is a mental health condition. When you have an anxiety disorder like I do and like so many other people do, anxiety disorders are um, the most common mental health condition out there. Women are uh, twice as likely as men than to develop one as well, um, which I think motherhood has something to do with that and contributes Might to it. A little bit, yeah. <laughs> um, so it's about just kind of educating as well and meeting them. You know, a lot of times those those comments are from coming from a place of love, um, and I'll, I have to remind myself they don't know what my faith looks like. Um, they don't know that I read my Bible, and they don't know that uh, my anxiety actually has brought me closer to God because when I am. I am turning to scripture. I am turning on my worship music. I am praying. Um, so I believe that my anxiety has brought me closer to him. I believe God can use my anxiety, other people's anxiety as well, to bring them closer to him. So educating people about the realness of anxiety disorders and that it's a mental health condition, just like any other, you know, cancer, diabetes that we face in this world. Anxiety is another one. And um, just meeting them with love, educating, and sometimes just having to say, nope, you're wrong. Um, sorry. And I'll pray for you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Why do you think that Oftentimes, as people of faith, we have an easier time accepting certain physical conditions, physical limitations, physical illness processes, and yet we struggle still in this area that has to do with emotions, even though our brain, our brains are a physical component of our physical body. Mm -hmm. What's your opinion on why we still seem to struggle in this way in the faith communities to accept that mental illness, mental issues that arise are treatable, are things that we can do things about, mm -hmm. and don't necessarily, it's not something that is necessarily like taking you down a path in any other way than something like a other physical ailment would do. Mm -hmm. I think it's because we can't see it. Mm -hmm. um, it is something that nobody, unless you physically have walked through it, you don't really understand the torture that it can bring, um, especially like when it comes to things like depression as well, and just how dark it can get the intrusive thoughts with depression or anxiety as well I um, my anxiety can cause intrusive thoughts as well so um, I think that not being able to see it um, is, a, is a big thing and then I think also just kind of taking a lot of you know biblical verses and just little chunks of them and kind of coming to our own conclusion of oh the Bible says do not be anxious well the Bible also says but in everything Thanksgiving prayers and petition, take it to God. So it's not always just a do not be anxious, but let's take it to God. Um, again, with the do not fear, fear not, well, because God is with us. Um, it is, it's an emotion for sure, anxiety and fear. Um, and some people don't struggle with it as, as much as others because it is that chemical imbalance in the brain or biological or genetic um, uh, causes the brain to have an anxiety, you know, when you're battling an anxiety disorder. So um, everybody's capable of anxiety, but the anxiety disorder just takes it to a whole other new level, and it's not something that people can see on the outside. 
Right, right. There's a lot of controversy still in our faith communities about mental wellness, about getting help, about going to therapy, about medications. Mm -hmm. How have you aligned that while also having deep faith in God? You've been very transparent about the struggles that you've had, the challenges you've had. You clearly have found an audience that is like, yeah, same here. Me, Mm -hmm. I'm grappling, I'm needing help, whatever. Mm -hmm. So how are you navigating that place interpersonally and how do you see that when it comes to receiving the kind of help that helps you fight back against this anxiety disorder with faith and with the tools that god has allowed us to have insight and knowledge into today um the way that i see it is medication and counseling is a gift from god just like um medication or insulin for diabetes um if we had a a migraine we would take some tylenol for it if we you know had cancer most likely a lot of us would choose to go through chemotherapy or radiation having it removed surgically um so while those are all you know gifts from god and the gifts of medicine and all of that i also believe that medication for anxiety or depression and counseling is also a gift from God and that's one of the ways that he can heal us. Um, I'm not going to lie, it was really hard for me to go back on my medication. Um, It's been like two years ago now. Um, I was off of it for three years doing great and then COVID happened. I had another baby and now I've had another baby on top of that baby and so uh, I've had to go back on the medication it was hard to do because it was like a I was doing great I'm such a failure I should have been stronger and I just had to remind myself nope life just got hard right now and this is okay because this is going to help me get through this and my kids need me to be the best that I can be for them in this season and this is one of the ways that God helps me Um, and that's the same with with therapy I actually just recently started therapy again here um two weeks ago. Um, I'm battling a little bit of postpartum depression here. I'm three, three months postpartum with baby number three. So I was like, nope, I'm going to do it. And, um, my pediatrician was very like, okay, do I need to, do we need to like up your meds or something? I'm like, I'm I'm going back to therapy. Let's take it one step at a time. I'm going to be proactive about it because I have no shame in going back to therapy. And this is something that's going to help me and help me get through this season because it's, been a tough season there's three of them now so right right <laughs> um so I, yeah i've just proactively done that to take care of my mental health and to try and just be the best mom that i can for my kids because it's been hard yeah yeah i mean i so appreciate just how open you are about that because so many women need to be able to hear that and need mm-hmm. to know and you bring up something that it's so important that often doesn't get talked about i have a friend i was talking with recently who really battled some significant anxiety and she got herself into therapy learned a lot of tools has done phenomenally well over the last several years and now finds herself in a place again and there's not been a major life event she hasn't had a baby nothing like that but she's found herself again going yeah Oh, she's heading into a new season of life and she realizes I need to head back and get kind of a tune up. Mm -hmm. And she was very clear about it's frustrating because I thought I kicked this to the curb. I thought that I had conquered this. And we had a really great conversation about these things are not a one and done. You you gather tools, you use the tools, you back up, you try again, yeah. you keep reading, you keep educating yourself. Sometimes that means going back into a counselor. Sometimes that means getting pastoral help. But that there's no failure here. This is not a failure of having, I didn't conquer it, you know? Yeah. It, yeah. it crops up. It's what you do when it crops up again that becomes of critical importance. Mm-hmm. How often do you find people in your world having seasons where they've they've got it under control a little bit more if you will and then seasons where they need to go back and review some of the things i mean is that pretty common to your to your listenership to your viewership that you have this you have you see this come up yeah i mean i i hear a lot of the i've been healed um i I get some comments about that like oh the lord delivered me of this and i've been healed and you know a lot of times i kind of 
makes me feel like, okay, well, why haven't I been healed? Yeah, <laughs> um, or, yeah. you know, it can make other people feel like, okay, what, am I not praying hard enough? Or did I do something wrong? There's this punishment. Um, so I, I do get a lot of people that will say they have been healed. And I have, I'm very leery of ever saying, like, I've been, I'm healed. It's done. Because I do know my personal life, it has been, it's ebbed and flowed. Like, there's been times where I have struggled way more with depression than I do with my anxiety and then there's other times where my anxiety is debilitating crippling I can't leave the house um and you know but depression's not looming over my head so it has been here you know up and down for me for most of my life to be honest and I I do get some moms that will say like you know I I battled postpartum depression and now I'm over it to the other side and that's you know great and there's other women though that we need to head on back and help pull them through as well so um it, it does I do think that it, it it just kind of depends on the season of life and like I said right now I've got a three-month-old I've got a book baby I'm launching I've got a kid yep. going to kindergarten I've got another kid that's going to start preschool um so it is just a busy hectic time in my life with a lot of transition a lot of new things a lot of stress um and so that was where it was just like okay yep no it's time to go back to to therapy and and take care of some stuff again right right how do you navigate you know the little the little eyes the little ears that are always watching us (laughs) and and we want a piece (laughs) oh yeah oh yeah exactly exactly they they want to be with you all the time they want (laughs) to see everything they want to they want to observe it all and even the things that you think they aren't watching or aren't aware of yeah they are they're watching all of it so how do you navigate this place of wanting to be open with your kids and honest with your kids Mm -hmm. and yet at the same time not necessarily make it so that being anxious all the time is normalized. Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. Like, like this mm-hmm. isn't necessarily the operating system that we're trying to operate off of. At the same time, we're wanting to be honest about our feelings. How do you do all of that? I know that with one of my kids, I've written about it before, that that child struggled with some anxiety in a very significant way as a younger child. And I felt so much guilt at times, honestly, Courtney, because I knew that during that pregnancy, I was super anxious during that Mm -hmm. pregnancy. And then here comes this child who really grapples with it and worries about all kinds of things and has all kinds of intrusive thoughts. And I'm like, that's my fault. This kid was in an amniotic bath of my anxiety (laughs) the whole time I was carrying them. (laughs) So how do you work with all of that, both identifying for your kids how you're feeling, but also trying to help them not necessarily catch your feelings, you know, to like keep all of that kind of navigable for everybody in a healthy way. What do you do? Yeah. Um, so I've been very, very transparent with my children as far as like, this is mommy's medication that she takes for her brain because sometimes she gets anxious. Um, I don't like try and hide it from them or anything. I want them to know that it is, it's very normal. Like just going to the pediatrician or the dentist when I take them to the, see those like, it, okay, mommy's going to go talk to her feelings friend. That's my therapist. Um, and that's just, it's normal. I want them to know that because if they ever because more than likely with my history, they could also struggle with depression or anxiety at some point in their life. Um, and I want them to know that there is no stigma with that and that, you know, there's no shame in getting help if they ever needed to. Um, I would say as far as just we talk a lot about emotions in our in our house, lots of books about reading about emotions, how to identify them. Um, my son has gotten really good at knowing, like, the difference between anxiety or anger and like all of these things um and i i want them to know when mommy is feeling a little bit like on edge it's something actually that I talked about in therapy just last week <laughs> um because my my depression right now has been kind of manifesting as anger and so right now i was like well, we're gonna have a code word for when mommy is starting to feel her anger creep up and she's like feels like she's about to snap i'm gonna say a word and i want when you hear that word i want you to know okay, mommy needs a minute. Like mommy needs to just cool down. She needs a moment to collect herself because otherwise mommy is going to probably yell at me. 
and she doesn't want to that's what I've explained it to mommy doesn't want to especially when you know it's just simple things like they need another fruit snack or something like right. mommy doesn't want to be on edge right now but mommy is having a really hard time dealing with her emotions specifically right now her anger and so our code word right now is peaches so when I mommy says peaches and just got to Give me a little moment here. Um, so being transparent and talking with them like that. And sometimes you kind of have to tailor the message because my three-year-old is not quite understanding yet. But my five-year-old, he's he gets it. And he's um, we've you know talked through a lot of different anxiety stuff with him as well. He struggled a little bit when he um, started pre-K last year with the separation anxiety. And so we've had to work through some of those feelings. So he gets it a little bit more than her. But... As far as like trying not to like pass my fears on down to them or like having them catch my anxiety in a sense, it's just really giving them the bare minimum of what they probably need to know. So why does mommy not want you to be playing out in the front yard? Well, because mommy cannot see you as opposed to where my brain is thinking because somebody could steal you and kidnap you and then you'll be gone forever like that was what my anxiety is telling me but okay no i need you to stay in the back because mommy needs to be able to see you to make sure that you are safe and you're doing what you're supposed to be doing or not doing what you shouldn't be doing um so giving them just little it's in bit bitsy pieces of of information to where they understand you know there could be a threat if I'm outside playing by myself um, or, you know, something I shouldn't be doing, but not giving them overload information of all of the what ifs that are going on in my head so that I'm not making them overly anxious or making them overthink things or make them think that this world is terrifying. I need to stay in my bedroom and never leave kind of thing. Right, right. That's a really great way to describe that in terms of still keeping it honest, but not overwhelming them with the level of information. I, I love that. Yeah. I, I've got a lot of things going racing in my brain, but they don't, they don't, they don't need to have all that. that. Right, right. <laughs> no. Exactly. Exactly. What is the relationship and how do you manage the relationship in a pretty delicate spot, which is that, that, that dance between anxiety and control. I know some people, I'm sure I've done it myself, that in an effort to manage their anxiety, they're trying to control everything. If they can mm -hmm. get the environment to be exactly right, if the house can look exactly like this, if everyone can act exactly as they need them to act, then mm -hmm. their anxiety will be under control. I've even seen that control issue crop up and it is it is couched in language that kind of is a king's ex for a lot of us which means oh this is my boundary like I'm I'm mm -hmm. and actually what's happening is you're trying to control everything so you don't feel anxious and you're trying to control others behavior and you're yes. calling that a boundary which that's not a boundary a boundary is about what you're going to do in any given situation should something come up not what everyone else should be doing mm -hmm. how do you talk to people about that that place where the antidote to anxiety is not being able to control everything <laughs> mm -hmm. um well, that's a good question so because it's something I really really struggle with still myself <laughs> and so it's hard to like sometimes give advice to people when I'm like I'm right there with you sister um <laughs> so for me I would say I I know a lot of moms that their way of controlling is like the house needs to be like spotless like they are obsessively cleaning their house because that you know if there's too much they get just overstimulated and it makes them anxious I am not like that um, my house is very messy until it gets to the point where uh, it is a problem but <laughs> <I'm>, <laughs> so it's funny how like anxiety can be completely different for two different women right, and, or right. men or whoever in a respect like one Something that makes one person anxious is going to be comp not make another person anxious. So for me, as far as control goes, like I got to I got to take care of the to do lists and the bills and the grocery shopping and all of the things because, oh, if something, you know, happens, and we drop the ball and that bill didn't get paid, then my water is going to be turned off or um if I'm not managing all of the to-do lists that need to be done for getting school ready, then the birth certificate's not going to get turned in, the immunization records won't be there, and my kid's not going to be able to start on time. So it's constantly just reminding myself of, okay, that's what I feel like I need to control to manage my anxiety and make sure that, you know, 
I'm not anxious because I'm controlling it. But what is really the worst case scenario that could happen? Okay, my water gets turned off, I pay the bill, it gets turned back on. Or, oh, my son can't start right away on day one, but I'm going to run back 20 minutes to, to the school and make that copy right then and there, and he will be there. Um, and just kind of reminding myself that it's a little bit okay if things go wrong, and that the worst case scenario of it is not at all, it's not that bad. Um, and then obviously, you know, other little things like if I'm behind the wheel of a car, then that means that I can't get in a car accident. Well, that's not true because there are other people on the road that are bad drivers. Um, so just kind of having to rationalize the fear of why my anxiety thinks I need that control and bringing it back to, okay, no, what's the worst case scenario that could indeed happen here? And it's really not something to get that anxious about or let it take my joy in this moment because it, it doesn't need to control me that much. Right, right. That's the relationship between control and anxiety is so fascinating because oftentimes we use control to try to mitigate the anxiety, but then actually the anxiety is controlling us. Womp, womp, womp. Yeah. The and I hear some people say like, oh, I'm just like type A and I just need to, you know, be very organized and very organized and structured and everything. I'm like, are you or do you have some anxiety? Yeah, <laughs> just, yeah. just being a little bit honest here with you. But <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah. Well, so many great thoughts. And I'm so excited because in addition to the beautiful community that you've developed, and I want to make sure we oh, direct you. the listeners that way, a great community where people can talk about these things, find people who are struggling with these same issues, and yet at the same, same time, offering a great deal of hope and a great deal of joy. You've mm -hmm. got a book coming out called Mama's Got Anxiety, but it's not not going to steal her joy. That title is so fun. Oh, thank you. Where can the listener go to find your community that you've built, find out information on the book, all the mm -hmm. stuff? Um, so pretty much all of the book links, um, as far as pre-order and links and pre-order bonuses, um, would be on my website. It's CourtneyDevich.com. Um, and then any, you know, connecting with me through social media, I'm on Facebook and Instagram at Courtney Devich Author. Um, so you can connect with me there as well. And the book is available September 5th, coming all up really right. quick here. Awesome. Well, Courtney, thanks so much for being on today. I know that the journey that you've had and your willingness to share that journey the journey yeah. you're still on is yeah. of so <laughs> much help to so many moms so thank you so much for that thank and Rebecca you. will have those links in the show notes so we're going to drive listeners to those places they can go awesome. find you in all the spots be sure and check out allmomdoes.com and all mom does on the socials because that's also a great community where you can find other women who are walking through the same seasons of life as you going through some of the same stuff and I love to connect with you too at Julie Lyles Carr on all the places particularly Instagram come see me on Instagram and be sure and share this episode. Grab that link and share this episode with another mom in your world who is grappling with anxiety and it's taken some of her joy. Be sure and share this because I know it's going to be of su such help to her. So Courtney, thanks again. We so appreciate you. Thank you so much for having me. And my dear listener, I'll see you next time on the Almondos Podcast. <laughs>